Welcome, everybody, and welcome back to the Lacrosse Thinkers podcast. Today, we have Dr. Laurie Harmon from the Department of Recreation Management and the Therapeutic Recreation, and we will, we will be talking about time wasted or time well spent, leisure in the new millennium. So we're going to have a conversation about how to have fun, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it better be fun. <laughs> okay. So let's start with the question about uh, what is what do you define as leisure? And why is that thing important to our life? Sure. So the idea of leisure is that, in a nutshell, it's the things that we do in our lives that are not obligations. I oftentimes will ask students, "What do you do in your leisure time?" And some of them will say, "Well, I sleep or I eat." And I kind of step back and say, "Well, let's talk about that a little bit more." So we have to sleep to live. We have to eat to live, right? So those are things that we're actually obligated to do in order to live biologically. So we wouldn't necessarily count those as leisure. Instead, leisure are the things where after work, and after sleep, and after eating to live, that time that you have where you do something that is for you, and only for you, um, is the thing that you want to think about when you're thinking about leisure. And it's important to us because if If you if we think about it, so often when we talk to people、uh, at their jobs, what are you in this job for? We'd love to say we're in this job because we loved intrinsically what the job does for us as human beings. But oftentimes we're in jobs where we're doing it to make a certain amount of money to live a certain lifestyle. And then when you dig a little deeper and you say, well, what's that lifestyle? What do you mean when you say to live a certain lifestyle? Well, I want to live this lifestyle because I want to go have a boat so that I can go water skiing or fishing, or so I have time to go hunting, or I have time to play with my family. And those are what's really happening is that the thing that we do in our free time, that non-obligation time, is part of what our leisure is. There's a little bit more to leisure also when you think about it.、Um, we can break leisure down in a lot of different ways. We can look at leisure as activity, the things, the actual actions that we take, the going boating and the fishing and the hiking and the camping. Or we can look at leisure as a spiritual kind of a thing. So it's something where I'm stepping back and I'm I'm part of a I have some kind of a contemplative practice that I do, and then I'm reconnecting with myself, or I'm reconnecting with the natural world, or I'm reconnecting spiritually in some way. And then I might also think of、um, leisure as just kind of time free from from all of the other obligations. So sometimes sometimes leisure can be as simple as Just sitting and looking out the window, and not engaging any particular kind of practice. So,、uh, does leisure have to be relaxing, or can it be competitive also? Can be really intense. Yeah. So, leisure is a big umbrella under which a lot of different things live. So, under leisure lives recreation and play and things like that.、Um, Leisure, in and of itself, doesn't have to fall into a particular category of it being quiet and relaxing or being competitive. It can fall that、uh, there's there's really a wide range of experiences, and I don't want to say activities because it's really more experiences that qualify as leisure.、Uh, and in fact, leisure has a、um, uh, we think of leisure as something that is good for us. We think of it as an opportunity to reconnect and develop our own well-being. Um, and it can be well-being physically, so being competitive and thinking through problem solving and and engaging with other people and and jumping back and forth. Those are things that that can be part of a leisure activity. That might be something where we wouldn't necessarily say, well, it's leisure, but we might call it recreation or we might call it play.、Um, learning how to、uh, collaborate with somebody else to problem solve a game like Risk or. Settlers of Catan, or something like that. That might be an activity that would be more of a playful activity,、um, but again, it falls under that broad umbrella of leisure.、Um, it can also leisure can also actually be things that、uh, are not necessarily good for us. So when we think of leisure, sometimes we think of things that are hedonistic, things that give ourselves pleasure, and all the things we do that give ourselves pleasure are not always things that are good for us as individuals or good for society. There's an entire avenue of leisure research. For example,、uh, some people will call it deviant leisure or、uh, purple leisure or taboo leisure. There's a lot of different terms out there depending on what you're looking at. They might be things that are very high risk、um, physiologically, 
so recently, uh, and you might have seen this, there was a um, gentleman who is a free solo climber, meaning he climbs mountains with zero equipment, no ropes, nothing to belay on or off. It's just him and the granite. And he free solo climbed Yosemite's uh, El Capitan. And some people would argue there's a, a discussion about is that leisure or is that not leisure and and how good is this for society how good is this for him as an individual because he's putting his life at risk you know to be hanging on a side of a granite cliff and if one misstep happens there's no coming back from that right mm-hmm. so that would be considered a very high risk kind of leisure and then the next question is and what does this do for society is this something are we telling our kids it's okay to go out and engage in these very high risk behaviors some people will question that Um, Other things that get categorized are things like sex tourism, uh, recreational drug use, things like that. So they are things that we do for our own self-pleasure, but they may or may not have, uh, they may or may not kind of contribute to the good of society in general. And part of that's dictated by what society values, which of course changes over time. Interesting. So Mm -hmm. from what you described, is it fair for me to say, for example, working and study Mm-hmm. can be also combined with leisure instead of like they're mutually in, 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 exclusive from each other. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's it's I love that you asked that question. So can work and study be combined with leisure? Can they can they kind of can you morph in and out of one? I know that I can in my field because I'm in the field of recreation. So I think about so many times when I go and visit national parks. Um, one of the things that my partner and I do is we every every year for our anniversary we want to go to a national park. Well, because I teach in recreation, so I'm teaching people how to plan facilities and how to think about human beings in a particular place and how you design for that. Everywhere we go, I always have a camera. Camera for uh, taking photographs for me, photography is definitely a leisure activity. And I will one minute be taking pictures of grizzly bears because they're so cool, and the next minute be taking pictures of, look at how the entrance to this interpretive center works because people are able to move through it. So I move from work to leisure. It's just a constant swinging back and forth. Um, I ask my students sometimes in some of the classes I teach to go outside when they read or spend a half an hour in a space where they have a window to the outdoors while they are studying. And so what happens is then they'll stop in the middle of studying, they'll look outdoors, they might kind of take a mental break, and so now they're contemplating or thinking or just people watching. And then they come back to studying. So that that movement of morphing back and forth between leisure, non-leisure, leisure leisure work, absolutely. Thinking about um, food as a good example. Mm -hmm. So food is an obligation. We have to have it to live. However, you know, have you ever gone out with your friends? You go have pizza, you're socializing, or you have a dinner party, right? Yeah. That's that's leisure for you. Yeah. If so it's just an obligation, injection will do the job, powder will do the job, right? Exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. So instead, the the food moves from just this obligation thing to something where now the kind of food is important, or it might even be preparing the food moves from being an obligation, which it certainly feels like to me on a weekday, but now you're having this sensory experience and you're laughing and you're talking. And, and again, there's, a, there's actually a whole body of research on that called the slow food movement. So how about if we take food and move it away from being so obligatory to bringing it back to what part of it was, was a an, uh, kind of a social community building experience. Interesting. Yeah. So do you feel like for uh, college students nowadays, do, are they having too much fun? too much leisure or actually they're working too much that the balance is not right there right yep uh excellent question i just was talking about this um, with the students i teach in a first year seminar course Uh, the research has told us that as we look at and 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 there's a whole body of research from outdoor industry association that looks at um, young people from ages six to ages 24 and we break them down into six and six to twelve, and thirteen to eighteen, and then the nineteen to twenty-four group. So the nineteen to twenty-four group is our college students. And when we ask them why do you not engage in outdoor recreation, so they're they're specific to outdoor recreation. We ask why they don't do it. The number one answer is because I don't have time. <laughs> Here's what's scary: when you ask six to twelve year olds, their number one answer is I don't have time. And my recollection of being a six-year-old, 
was never about not having enough time to go outside or to do some kind of recreation activity, right? But that's one of the challenges today is we've really programmed young people's life experiences so much. And part of that's, you know, because when we have, if, if uh, you know, both parents are working, you kind of do have to program your child's um, experience because you can't, you, you know, it would not necessarily be a safe thing to let them just be sitting there at six year old, six years old at home doing nothing, right? Yep. So um, the idea of thinking about, though, what does that mean then when you think about recreation? If recreation, if we're supposed to be evolving into learning about it, by the time college students get here, they have learned to structure their day so much that they no longer have time for leisure. And in fact, the class that I'm teaching, that first year seminar course, um, the students have already reflected back to me in, over the first probably three or four weeks oh my gosh, I didn't realize how important leisure might be to me and that I might want to think about incorporating it more into my day instead of so much studying or so much of what the other obli obligation feeling things are that I do. So what do you think will be a healthy balance between the time we spend on, let's say, hardworking obligations and the time we spend on um, leisure activities or leisure kind of psychological behavior, uh, activities like uh, spiritual uh, other than sleeping? Right, so we got 16 hour left. Yeah, yeah. So in a 24 hour day, if you assume eight hours of sleeping, um, then you've got 16 hours left. You know, I've never thought about it from an hourly perspective, and I think the reason I don't think about it is because for me it's an integrated thing. So my sig kind of when I think about what's a healthy balance, I ask somebody to ask themselves, um, where are they integrating it? Maybe right now. So somebody. Uh, maybe some of my colleagues that I work with, for example, they might take an hour off at lunch or a half an hour off at lunch and go for a nice walk, and that would be a leisurely activity. Um, I, more often than not, though, what I really see is I really see faculty members, for example, they're at their desk all day. Yeah, so they're not ta nobody takes an hour for lunch. You eat lunch sitting at your desk while you've got something else going on in the background, right? Yeah, you know. So, um, We're quite a multitasking. Who are we kidding? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So then I say if you're not integrating it into your day while you're at the office, how do you integrate it when you get home? Um, and each person does it a little differently. So some person, like some of my colleagues, might go home and say, oh, uh, you know, I play with the dogs for a half an hour. Oh, fantastic. And then I say, do you, you know, and what do you do? Well, you know, I do relax at dinner. And some people will do kind of a more mindful dinner maybe with family at home others uh, will take a break and go outside some people will continue working while they're eating even at home um, and so then I'll then you know you have to kind of get people thinking what do you do to turn off and mm -hmm. maybe that's the bigger piece is what do you do to step away from those obligations and do you feel like it's enough just like sleep what's enough for you might not be enough for me and what's enough for me might be way too much for you so it really is independent. Knowing yourself yeah. and paying attention to your life, which a lot of people just don't, right? We want a uniform cut. It's just like you eight hour, I do eight hour. Right. Those kind of things, which is easy. Yeah. Interesting. So um, so it's really difficult to, to differentiate between, you know, obligations and leisures, especially when you're having fun, when you're doing your work. Right. Partly, right? So what are some signs we should look for to tell us like, oh, we may need more leader activity. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the beauty of starting to recognize those signs. They are there. Signs that you're not getting enough leisure are feeling frustrated constantly with work, feeling like the things that you do that are obligations are overwhelming you, um, feeling, and, and there's some real classic things like, you know, not, not feeling like you can say no Mm. And so you're starting to feel pressure from those outside obligations. Just want to make sure because yeah. are, that can be also a personality, right? Like being agreeable yeah. as a person. So is it fair it's to true. say is like I'm not – I feel like I can't say no and this is not like me. Right, and it's not something you want to do. Hmm. So um, – and, and it's interesting because that can actually fall into the leisure world also. For example, I might, I might want to have more recreation in my day or have leisure in my day, and my leisure involves me walking around in the backyard listening to the birds. But my best friend calls me up and says, let's go, uh, let's go to the restaurant tonight, or let's go to the pub tonight for happy hour, happy hour or something like that. 
and I want to socialize with her, but that's not the activity I want to do. So I go and I socialize, and it's almost kind of, it's a leisure activity, but it's not my ideal leisure activity. So it doesn't give me back what it is. Make me more stressful. Yeah, there might be some stress involved. And so somebody will say, well, you got to go, you got to go out last night for two hours. You had your leisure activity. And, And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, but it didn't give me back what I want. So that's part of it, and there's and that's an element to true leisure. If you're really thinking about pure leisure, it's what you want to do as an individual. It's what meets your needs. It's not what other people tell you to do. Based on what you said, um, for all the kids nowadays, right? Mm-hmm. They were not given the room to even explore enough room to explore what their leisures are. So I think I'm gonna guess if you ask students nowadays, what do you want to do to have fun? They will say, I don't know. Yes. I don't have a hobby, and. What what's your suggestions to people who say I I want to have leisure activity yep. but which leisure activity because I have zero experiences in yeah. doing all these. Yep. So one of the it's funny the that you asked that. So one of the assignments that I had in my first year seminar class was an assignment called Recreation Resources. Students were asked to look around the city of La Crosse and identify three recreation activities that they had not considered doing before and find three agencies that delivered recreation and explore what those agen- what kinds of activities those recreation agencies deliver and then look at those three recreation activities that they hadn't done before and choose one and do it. So they had to do something that was new and they didn't and then say would they do it again, why or why not? Um, kind of how might that activity be adapted to people of differing abilities and things like that. And um, it was fascinating to watch what students had to say. A lot of them said, "Gosh, I you know, I didn't even, I didn't know where to start. And then once I started, then I kind of, it took me down the rabbit hole. And so once they found some place um, like an Explore Lacrosse uh, and looking on the Explore Lacrosse website, and then they said, oh, hey, there's the Segway tour or an escape room or, oh my gosh, or hiking the bluffs or something like that. And what they found, or axe throwing, you know, I mean, all these different activities where they said, I didn't even know you could do that stuff. And that was part of it, I think, is, at the college level, our, the parental influence is gone. It's not quite gone, but it's starting mm-hmm, to mm-hmm. ease out, right? Yep. And so, you know, parents can, at the younger level, say, I want you, child, to explore this. But now you're at college, the, the student can say, well, I can do what I want. So the idea is to create some kind of a, some kind of a reason to have to go out and explore a couple things. And then that might inspire the students next to say, all right, so hey, I'm feeling that kind of down, depressed. It's the end of the semester. You know, I remember in that class we explored some opportunities. I'm going to go check out this website and see if I can find something else. Yeah, I yeah. feel like it's almost always work. It's just you tell people if you work too hard, you don't have leisure, you die. And then suddenly <laughs> people will actually, okay, I need to go out right. and, and do some activities. They need to realize like you cannot just work all right. the time without doing leisures. And that's hard because in we're in the Midwest and you've heard of the Midwest work ethic and it's real. And and the idea of just sitting and leisurely doing nothing for your whole life is not something you know, people would just kind of go, no, uh-uh, I don't want to do that. But kind of looking at it and thinking about, all right, but we do have to bring in a balance. And it And it is okay sometimes just to sit for half an hour and do nothing. I bet if you were to ask most, if I were to ask most students, when was the last time you just sat for half an hour and did nothing? 100% of them would say, never. Mm -hmm. At the very least, they're going to have their smartphone with them. And they're going to be looking at that because there's there's always this feeling of, I'm constantly connected, so I better be checking to make sure I didn't miss out on some connection that just happened. To just sit for 30 minutes and do nothing is such a foreign concept to most of us. Exactly, or even just not doing nothing but thinking. Like yeah. I ask my students in class, like you do homework, fine. You do all the writing, fine. When do you have time to think or even review? Say, hey, I've been, I've been in college for half a semester now. What am I learning? How am I different from the beginning? Right. Those kind of things actually, while I was in college, that's the most productive moment. That is, you put every piece of information together and try to make a leap almost like within a, an afternoon. 
Yeah, that's good. And I like the way you said that. I think I'm going to pick that up for my uh, final project that I'm having them do. That it's interesting. Piece of it. That's yeah. a good question. Because How are you different now than you were when you came? Because when the, there was a psychological experiment when people did, I think it was in 1980s. They yeah. just took all the number one students who scored, who, uh, the students who scored number one in the exam, final exams. After one month, say, everybody come back. They don't know what happened. And then they, they give them the exact final exam and say, hey, we take it. And then none of them passed. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, you got a 98% yeah. or whatever. Okay, now you got below yeah. 60%. So what are you exactly learning? Right. Right? So that's actually the, the part I think people, I constantly feel like a student nowadays, they, their schedule is so busy. They yeah. don't have the room to reflect on themselves. So they think they're learning a lot of things, but the fact is you're not learning a lot of details and procedures, but that's not your thing. That's in the book. Right, right. Yeah, and then what happens is they miss, I think, when that happens, when we just focus in on learning that particular tiny chunk of information, we miss two things. We miss the understanding of how it applies to whatever larger scenario we want to apply to. And we also miss the opportunity to say, how could it apply to my personal situation. So I can learn a lot of things in different topics. I can learn things about biology. I can learn things about mathematics. It doesn't matter what the topic is. The question for me is how does that apply to what I do in recreation? And the more I stop and think, the more I start to make the connections and build the bridges. And if I don't ever stop and think, I never build the bridges. It's just little bits and there's no connection between them. And the building bridges takes time. So if you yeah. never do that, actually they would never be built. Right. Right, so that's interesting. Yeah. So when you talk about the Midwest work ethic, mm -hmm. is it does it have something to do with um, you know the tradition of farming, and yeah. basically you're constantly working? But let's be frank, farming is part of working, but it's part of leisure for sure. You are connecting with the nature, seeing the birds, seeing the animals, seeing the crops and everything. Right. So if you, if before you think work ethic is like working all day, yeah, but you are actually putting leisure into your working. Sure. Yeah. Right. So. Well, and also if you think about the farming community, uh, things that would happen like a gathering of food. So um, I know my family grew up farmers, and one of the things I distinctly remember was that when we would get together, lunch was everybody got together. You stopped, you took a uh, noticeable break from baling hay or feeding the cows or whatever it was you were doing, and everybody stopped and came together and ate together. And we all helped my grandmother in the kitchen. And so there was this kind of fun social community building, and we were talking about what was going on. And, and we did the same thing at the end of the day, and you kind of talked about the day. And so there was this reflection and discussion and connection. And so that became a, a leisure activity. So oftentimes, and also you can kind of look back and, and really looking back into history, things like quilting, those were social activities. They were activities that were designed to produce something that was necessary, a quilt. So somebody had to sew it, somebody had to put it together, but you turned it into a social and leisure activity. A barn building, putting up a barn together was also an activity that was work and some kind of leisure in that respect. So yeah, the, the idea of differentiating between leisure time and work time wasn't necessarily something that was so, um, so defined. What we have now is we really define it. We really define that a little bit differently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's interesting for or me to see because when students are choosing jobs, future jobs, right? Mm -hmm. There's one part I always ask them to think about is just like the leisure part or the cultural part. It's just like in addition to doing something which is redundant every day, right? Do you find fun or do you find purpose or do you find, you know, some uh, or a community, a culture mm -hmm. in the work you do? And nothing should weigh in when you consider which job you're going to take. Right. That's kind of part of, ap part of the conversation, actually. So if for nowadays, I feel like f with the modern industrialization, uh, we are treating human as machines in their working place. Mm -hmm. And if you still keep those kind of work ethic, which we can pretty make sure that there's zero leader in, in the redundant stuff, right? Then that's actually that good ethic started creating you trouble. Right. So we need to see it from a more sophisticated point of view. Mm -hmm. Another comment I want to make is um, why I travel to see different kind of people. I saw a lot of people who are in Wall Street earn a lot of money, super su successful, but their life is a mess. Yes. Right? Yes. And actually, if I go back and think about it, almost all the people I see who can put themselves together in a really sophisticated way, they all grow part of from like 
farms or you know from like a blue collar parenting because they kind of i don't know it's just like i feel like they're more developed well around because they have seen so much when we're when they're working on the farm okay. now i go back and think about it maybe they it's just because they have the luxur- luxury to have a lot of time for their own well and i'm not sure if it's total luxury so having grown up on mm-hmm. having spent some time on a farm you especially if you're on a dairy farm for example it's a 24 it's almost a 24 7 operation so it's you really don't have it's not that you have that luxury of time it just looks different mm-hmm. um so farming's pretty hard work and one of the things that um and and i don't you know it's interesting i don't know that i would differentiate if i understand what you're saying right I don't know that I would necessarily differentiate the ability of um, people who come from more rural communities versus coming from the cities in terms of being able to engage in leisure. It's just a different kind of leisure lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly in the cities, life's a little bit faster paced, but it's we call it faster paced. I'm not sure if it's faster paced or just differently paced. It's a different kind of pace. Um, and it's, it's difficult for me to, to really speak to that because it's not how I grew up. Um, I have nephews who live outside of Minneapolis um, and I have a sister who lives in Chicago. So I see evidence of how their kids are growing up in an area that's a very urban area and um, kind of thinking about all the activities that they're engaged in and then the added constraint I think of um, kind of feeling obligated to enrich their lives with all of these activities i think that's part of it so it's almost like in a rural area you don't have as many options you're limited with the options so you work with the options you have in a in a highly urban area there's so many options i suspect there's a pressure on on parents to say if my child didn't have this experience they're not the better for it right so there's there's con there's constantly the uh feeling of uh competent and it kind of gets back to what you said at the beginning a feeling of not of somewhat competition, but also of if I didn't do it, then I'm not a good parent. No, it become obligation. They yeah. kind of remove the leisure part from it. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting for me to see because in China, the parents just push the kids really hard. As yes. long as we have the time, we have the money, we're going to do it. Yep. Music, you know, painting, everything. And their kids grow well around, fine, with skills, though. Right. But I, I've rarely seen any, anybody who is super good with piano actually loves playing piano. Yeah, so there's the difference between the skill and the passion. Yeah. I can love it and be awful at it, <laughs> or I can be great at it and hate it. Yeah. And then I think to myself, well, which one would I rather? And I kind of, in my personally, I'd rather love it and be awful at it, right? And that that to me is a much more that to me speaks more to leisure. When you really when you excel at it but you hate it, it's moved. It's certainly moved out of leisure and feels much more obligatory. Yeah. Yeah. You already got a major. You already got a job. You don't want to make everything to be <laughs> your job or right, your professions, right? right? Exactly. That's interesting. So you mentioned the smartphone. Yes. So let's go back to this question, <laughs> which is super interesting. Uh, technologies, do they build a barrier or do they build a bridge for a new type of leisure, recreation, or nature? So the short answer is they do both. Mm-hmm. And I think when we started moving into the smartphone world in particular, um, there's, there's always a tension barrier bridge um, that I think there's a belief that we'd like them, we'd like them to just sit in a nice space where they're a barrier. Right. And say, well, the reason kids don't go outside is because they're on their media all the time. It's actually been interesting. One of the things we have found is in some in some studies, there has been kind of a mix to this. In some cases, when uh, kids who are higher media users are actually the ones that are spending more time outdoors. Go figure. Right. It's not something that we would anticipate. Um, And so what we're finding is that technology can be a barrier or it can be a bridge, depending on how it's used and how. Um, how in what way the person is is using it to to engage in their recreation or leisure choices? Um, so a good example of that as uh, and I think I'd mentioned that I've done a an un- I use an underwater robot to get uh, kids connected to their uh, outdoor aquatic environments. And the idea is this robot is the robot itself. It's called an ROV, a remotely operated vehicle. It's about the size of a football, a large football. I could pick it up with one hand. Um, so it's really cute. It's yellow, uh, and it, so it, it looks like it has a little personality. And so when I bring when I bring students, I, I, and I work with college students, and I work with uh, 
pretty much kids sixth grade through 12th grade and then college students. So when I bring people in to look at this, um, the first thing they do is they go, wow, that's really fancy, it's really cute, that's really interesting. And then the control box that is used for it, so it has a control box and then it has a video screen. So the video monitor is where, where I can see what it sees when it's in the water. And the control box is a big joystick with a couple of other little controls, so it looks just like a video game. And in fact, there's been some homemade ones where people have made them and they will use actual joysticks from video games to control the ROV. So clearly you're kind of saying, wow, this is a technology thing. It looks like a video game. And as soon as I make it look like a video game, young people look at it and they're like, man, I know how to, I know how to operate this thing, right? So sure enough, they get on there and the first thing they want to do is make it go as fast as it can. And, and we, you know, we kind of get that out of the way. And then I say, now, what can you see in the water? And they kind of go, oh, I didn't even think about that. Let's see what the water, let's see what the aquatic environment looks like. So it becomes this exploratory tool where then they say, oh, look at the plant life and, and look at the aquatic life. There's fish and there's snails down here and whatever it is I see. And that's where it starts to build the bridge to, oh, there's something else out there. And gosh, I might want to know more about it. Or gosh, there's fish down here. And and maybe that's something where, I, you know, I might like to go fishing in the future, or I might like to think about swimming, or in some cases, maybe I don't want to swim here because I see what's in the water, right? Um, so it can do that kind of a thing. There are um, a lot of apps out there now uh, that we have on our smartphone. I mean, the world has just exploded in that, quite obviously. I use uh, citizen science tools to get students engaged with their outdoor environment, um, things like iNaturalist or Nature's Notebook. Uh, or Audubon, there's, a, there's Wisconsin specific apps out there where I go find these things or one like Leaf Snap where I, I'm just walking along and I go, hey, what the heck kind of tree is that? And so I take a little picture of the leaf, plugs it in, and the next thing you know, I have information about what that tree is, where it grows, what kind of fruit it has, what other, what connections it might have to my environment. Um, so all those are things that start to build an understanding of the outdoors and when I build an understanding of the outdoors, I start to become connected to it a little bit more. And if I become connected to it a little bit more, it becomes more friendly to me, and then I want to interact with it a little bit more. And it's kind of a leap when you're making some of these things. But if I never know anything about it, I don't know what I'm missing. It's only when I start to learn about it that I start to say, ooh, maybe I want to be part of that. Um, so, And I focus mostly on the outdoors. There's some other, other pieces too. But technology has that ability to bridge bridge that connection interesting you mentioned those kind of app mm -hmm. it's almost like instead of building a museum you bring the museum to the wildlife yeah and my experience is just like how great is that you have a father or you have a brother who knows the like the name of the trees and birds and everything right but now it's at your finger clip and it's only three dollar <laughs> and you can have those kind of things or many of them yeah. are free i'm actually yeah. i i think <clears throat> i in my whole life i've paid for two apps I pride myself on finding the freebies, right? Because I know that students have a limited budget. So I'm always trying to test things that are free that might give, give young people and students a chance to connect. And um, I think that's exactly it. When we are, we're, you know, we talk about the role that parents have played historically or primary caregivers have played historically in getting young people outdoors or getting them engaged in recreation and leisure activities. If we don't have that as much, or even for, for a child who might not have that, then the opportunity to, this is, this is really a great example of meeting, meeting people where they are. Kids have cell phones, they have smartphones and they wanna use them all the time. So if I can create a little thing that says, hey, come here, come check this out. I'm not there, I'm not your primary caregiver, but you come check this out and this is pretty cool. It can, be, it can really have a positive influence on their likelihood to engage in those activities in the future. It's very interesting. So uh, that's the, the robot thing you remind me of something really exciting that is, say, if I don't know how to dive or right. I can still see the underground water. And if, if I got some health conditions or even disabilities that I cannot go somewhere, but now the ro robot can basically share with me half the experiences almost. That's and exactly eventually, it. if we want to go to the moon or go to the Mars, which mm -hmm. physically only a handful of people can do in the world. But right. now you can actually remote a robot on moon and try to see what it is, is it like to see the Earth from moon and everything. It's pretty exciting. But now my question becomes, let's say 
from what I'm hearing, you can use this thing as a initiation mm -hmm. to inspire people to appreciate the, right. the nature more. Um, is it okay if we just stop there and say, hey, you are not going to experience the real thing, but the fake thing is pretty good. Like video games, w fake planets, right. fake animals. Does it provide a equivalent or comparable experiences as a good leader? old virtual I reality, right? Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. So virtual reality, the thing about virtual reality is right now, the way we have it is it's, primi it's primarily tapping into two senses. So it's tapping into sight and sound, right? It, now there are haptic uh, options out there, things where you can you can feel you can actually feel the vibration, uh, you can feel the texture. There are some that that is coming along, um, but the smell we typically don't get, um, we don't get the taste, so we're missing a couple of our key senses. And for somebody who doesn't have sight or who doesn't have access to um, any kind of audio. That's a real limitation. Whereas I can send somebody out in a forest and say, touch, and I don't even have to say anything. I can just take their hands and have them feel that soft carpet of white pine needles or crush them, and they can smell that, that nice piney scent. There's an experience that you cannot get virtually, at least at this time. That could change over time, for sure. For sure. But so, and, and I can't speak to what will happen future in the future, with respect to how that will affect us. But what we find are a couple of things. So the research has been kind of coming in fast and furious on this. And so far there's there's been a little bit of, there's been some differences. Um, one of the things we find is with virtuality, virtual reality and with gaming, for example, it builds a certain set of cognitive skills. Uh, people who are gamers, for example, have, have pretty high executive functioning. So they're able to, uh, they're actually, actually able to engage in pretty good uh, emotional self-control, thinking through problem solving, planning, you know, anticipating something that's coming and so responding. So hold on a second, not only just cognitive, they have emotional control too. Yep, they're, they're yeah. able to use some of that, it's all part of that executive functioning uh, piece that we look at. Um, however, that, so that's one, those are one set of variables to measure. Another set of variables is to measure your satisfaction with life, your uh, feeling of self-worth, your um, the amount of s like your social network, and things that are kind of more of a social component. And what we find is people who are spending a lot of time on media, high media users versus moderate media users, they are less likely to report being happy. They're less likely to report having that social network. And they're less likely to kind of score high on some of these other um, emotional components. So it's not the same. It's definitely not the same. Does it offer some positives? Absolutely. Um, and in fact, obviously, one of the things it offers that uh, being outside, so if I'm or engaging in the activity, if I'm actually engaging in basketball, I can twist something. I can hurt myself. If I'm engaging in virtual basketball, my risk is gone on that. So there's there's risk and reward in both of them. And the question is, you have to ask yourself, which risk is it? So from my perspective, um, what I think for people when I'm thinking about young people is they need to have that balance. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything wrong with video games. I'm not a gamer myself. Um, but like I say, I, we have some evidence that it builds some skills. If that's the only thing a child does, I think it's going to put them at risk for some other pretty important skills as they move through life, right? Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So we have so many senses, but if you go into computer simulation, it will enlarge, it will amplify s part of it. Mm -hmm. But for the rest, we're just not there yet, like smelling, touching, and those kind of things. And if you keep receiving this low-dimensional information, your brain starts to have a little bit, I won't call malfunction, but it become but a it little may. bit strange, right? Sure. You don't have a dynamical, you don't have a multidimensional view of the world. You right. lose the reality of it. Right. Interesting. It's like eating healthy. It's the same thing. Having leisure, having healthy leisure is not so different than eating healthy. So if you think about, when we think about like really food health, we think about all things in moderation as being kind of that broader umbrella that, that is a healthy choice. You know, you, you hear about the you know, people who eat just one food group and it does not serve them well because everything else kind of shuts down. If I just serve one group of leisure in my life, then the other things are going to start to shut down. And so that won't serve me well in the long run.
It's almost like like a uh, calorie, right? You yeah. just look at calories when you eat. You don't care about which category. Just like calorie low, high, low, yeah, high. Yeah. After a while, you become super, I won't say healthy, but efficient in a certain way mm-hmm. because you control the calories so well. You control your weight or something, but you certainly lose the uh, all the others, right? Right. Interesting. So um, let's talk a little bit about having leisure with people, like how that thing should be conducted and what are some nice activities uh, in research showed that it really add to the social part. Sure. So when you're thinking about the idea of social leisure, a lot of things happen in social ex- experiences. When we're talking with somebody else, we're doing things like negotiating, we're collaborating, we're problem solving, we're learning to listen, and we're learning to communicate. So there's all these different kind of skill sets that get built or that we're always kind of that are evolving in that social experience. The other thing, another piece of social experience is affirmations. So we're getting affirmations from others that what we're doing is acceptable or it's welcome or it's appreciated in some way, right? Um, If we are engaging in a leisure experience that's a healthy leisure experience, typically these these things are happening in a way that build them in us. So they build our self-confidence, they build our self, self-esteem, self uh, they maybe build our ability to, um, to negotiate threats to self-esteem when we're in a scenario where that might occur. Um, they're building these self pieces and then they're building our ability to be part of that positive experience for somebody else. So that's a lot of what happens in that kind of social place or that social sphere. Um, places where in lacrosse where that can happen, I will say that, and so I'm going to take this from my students who, who shared with me all these things that they tried. So the number one thing they tried was hiking up Granddad's Bluff. So they did some of the hikes in Hickson Forest. Um, some of them went to the rim of the city road and hiked out there. And every, I don't think any of them said that they hiked alone. I think they all hiked with somebody. So it wasn't just the activity, but it was the social quality of uh, sharing stories with each other or helping each other when one person would fall and slip or uh, stopping and just quietly sharing the moment of a beautiful sunset and, that one of them had told me about. So the so that's one great place, I think, is looking at any of the parks that we have in the city of La Crosse. Granddad Bluff is a big one. Um, Riverside. Uh, I also will go south of La Crosse a little bit to Goose Island. That's a place for me where um, my partner and our dog, we will often go out and walk around. Do the uh, kayaking there? Yes. It's a beautiful place to kayak. So, yep, kayaking, hiking, camping, fishing, hunting. Those are all activities that I see the students do, that I've engaged in several of them. Um, let's see, other activities that they tell me about. I think I mentioned a few of them that are kind of in the downtown lacrosse area. So some of them, like, one of them was actually saying a really great social activity is to go coffee shop hopping. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah, so the Root Note is a fun place to go because there's music there. So they liked, ch- they liked checking that out. And then they would try out, you know, coffee and snacks at each of the different shops and see what the different vibe was. If I went down to the Charmant, what was it like? Or if I came back up to Grounded, what was it like? And so on. So the that idea of... Um, enjoying the activity with somebody else and laughing about it or um, and that and I you know it's one of the things I, I in this whole discussion of leisure I don't think I've ever mentioned that till now is when we are engaged in something that's pleasurable to us oftentimes we engage in that activity that age-old activity of laughing and the laughing sometimes you get to laughing so hard you can't stop laughing and it feels incredible it feels refreshing it feels good it feels like you lighten your soul, so to speak. And that is a, that's a big piece of it. And when you're with somebody else, that is when that laughing oftentimes occurs. So that's... I scope is pretty strange. I'm sitting alone. Right, right. <laughs> Although out, every once around. in a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Cool. Okay. That, that's really interesting. Yeah, I learned a lot actually from this conversation already. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to laugh more now, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. So... um. Let's talk about, we mentioned this in the title, actually. Um, when, when do we know there is a too, man, too much leisure, leisure? Some would argue there is no such thing. Okay. <laughs> so 
part of the title, Time Wasted, is just a headline? Actually, well, there's no that thing? or yeah. it's getting people to think about, is there such a thing as time being wasted? Interesting. Yeah, yeah. so I will, I will say this. For me, if I, I think for some people, when you think time wasted, it's like, well, you're sitting there doing nothing. For me, if I were to look at my life and structure out what are the times that are wasted, probably the wasted times are the times when I have had such a day where I come home and I sit in the chair and I turn the TV on and I just do that thing called vegging in front of the TV where I'm really not even paying attention to what's going on. I'm not, I don't, the world ex doesn't even exist. It disappears. And for 30 minutes or 60 minutes or however long it's just sitting there, I'm doing nothing. That I'm, it's not that I'm not doing nothing. It's that none of it is making, is helping me. It's just happening and I'm just letting it happen and I'm letting the time pass. Uh, sitting there playing games on my phone, I would, to me, is time wasted because all I'm doing is passing time because I don't want my brain to think about other things. Especially when I say people heard, I heard people saying killing time, I say don't count me in. Like, right. I don't have time to kill. Right, right. But yet sometimes, the, but at the same time, I suspect there would be those who would argue, maybe if I think deeply through it, maybe I need my brain not to do anything else but decide in solitaire whether the two of diamonds goes on the ace of diamonds or something like that, right? Or whatever game it is that I'm playing. Maybe I just need that. Maybe I need that to step away, to start to bring myself down. I, 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 I can see the reason, but then I will ask this question. In that kind of case, isn't it better to just take a nap? Exactly. Well, and that's why I, that's why I would say okay. is it from a time wasted perspective I say, you know, I think that I think that there are other things that I could do that would feel better to me. And so what you're doing is you're asking yourself when you're looking at it time wasted versus time well spent. The bigger question is is it is it something that helps you feel better in some way? Of course then if you go down that path, this there's a lot of rabbit holes in leisure. <laughs> <laughs> if you go down the path, if it makes me feel better, then recreational drug use is okay, yeah, right? Yeah. And in some cases, you know, you, that, that begs the question. It begs the discussion. How, is there a point at which the temporary making you feel better changes to a, uh-oh, now this is an addiction, and now I can't stop doing it, and it's no longer making me feel better, or I'm having to engage in it at such a level that it's causing me to not be able to complete my work obligations, or it's resulting in me not engaging in something that is a healthier lifestyle. And that's, that's, that's where it starts to become a little tricky. Addiction almost become an obligation, right? That, right. That's the same conversation again. Yeah, yeah, that's a nice way to think about it. You can think about nice, it. It's just not like there's anything nice about addiction. But you yeah. hear so many people talking about, I hate it, but I have to do it. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to play this game anymore, but I just can't stop. Right. right. That's the moment you know, okay, <laughs> it's not helping. Yeah. Then that's a but great then time why exactly do you have to, to do stop. It? Yeah. Then that's obligation, right? Interesting, right. Because, for, because for me, for our modern people especially, we focus so much on time and schedule. Mm -hmm. For example, for me, like I go to bed at 11. So if I'm sleepy 9.30, I will somehow find a way to pretend I'm doing something until the clock says 11. Ah, yes, right? yes. That's yep. when I started to say, hey, I don't, I don't feel like I can learn or study or work anymore right. because clearly my, my mind cannot focus. Right. Let's just open some show which I have seen before because I don't feel like I can even take in new shows. Right, yeah. <laughs> but we have one hour and a half to just pass by so 11 will be, you know, the, 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 the thing I should be doing. Right. But nowadays, like after I get a little bit older, I start to see, oh, why? Why do I put a restriction on 11? And why do I do that? If I yep. feel like I want to take a nap 9.30, before I think this is childish, like, you know, you are supposed to go, 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 go to bed at 11. You go to bed at 9.30, that means you're not doing your job. Right. Now I feel like, uh, I almost feel like, as long as you get a little bit older, you start to say like, who am I kidding? And <laughs> why am I following <laughs> those kind of rules? Which yep. is, right, so be myself, and just if you're tired, you take a break. It's sure. just as easy as that, right? Yep. Interesting, so how, how do we tell that our hobby is not helping or like is dragging dragging us down. Yeah, one of the so one of the things to think about is are you able to do the work that you need to do? 
that you and it, and that's that's different from saying people are asking me to do too many things. I mean, it's one thing if people are asking you to do too many things and you can't get your work done in the time frame you expect to. That's one issue. But if your hobby is starting to not allow you to complete that work and you see it as a problem, you clearly know it, right? Yeah, yeah. Then that's a problem. Now, if my hobby is not letting me do my work anymore, and I sit back and I reflect on that and I say, well, you know what? I don't really like my work anymore, and I think I'd rather do my hobby, because I think my hobby will take me on a better path. That's that's a little different thing. That's kind of that's maybe rethinking your vocation. That that can be part of it. And in fact, sometimes sometimes leisure, and that's the thing is leisure creates that space where oftentimes we can step back. It's a safer space where we can step back and we can rethink that and say, is this thing that I'm doing here, that's my vocation. Is it giving me what I want it to give, or do I want to step back and rethink that path? I mean, I know I've reinvented myself several times. I was a, um, I, I when I went to school, I actually quit school for a while. I was a secretary for a few years. Then I came back to school. Then I got a degree in landscape architecture. I was designing golf courses for about seven years, and then I said, you know, I don't want to really do that. And so then I kind of came back and I said, you know, I really, I've always liked this idea of thinking about things and. And maybe maybe academics is a, has a world for me, and how can I do that and connect to the, the the things that I love with respect to recreating outdoors? And holy cow, there's this degree in recreation, and right. And so I mean, there's there's and and it's interesting because for me, I was lucky enough that the sphere where I was thinking about those things was on an outdoor hiking. It was like a four week hiking trip through the Canadian Rockies. Man, that's a great place to be thinking about what you want to do for your life. And then to be able to say, "This is what I want to do for my life. I want to connect it somehow," you know, that's that becomes that that uh, gives you agency to think about something. So yeah, I really like the the, yeah. the comment you make on uh, uh, stepping away. It's just like you focus on something something so much, and that's gonna become narrow because that's what we call focus, right? Right. You don't you kind of ignore everything around it, even if it's very close to what you don't see it. Mm-hmm. Right. So it, once in a while, you need to step away and see the bigger picture, which means you need to lose your focus.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. It's yeah, not actually、exactly. you just step away. You see it. If you step away, you still look at the thing. You still focus on that still small thing, right? Right. So you step away, lose your focus, like in the park. Yep. For four weeks, and that's when you start to actually rethink your life from multi dimension instead of just one narrow path. Think about yourself instead of just your role in the society, your role in terms of your training, your role in terms of like whatever. Your parents or your society or your school had put、sure. you through, and almost like a lot of people, I see even myself, I see the leisure part or the part I like and the part I need to play, going separate. But actually,、right. you do have the control,、mm-hmm. and you do have the you need to spend a lot a lot of effort, of course, to unite them.、Mm-hmm. And once you unite them, it's either you find fun, leisure in your work, or you find a way to work with your leisure. Right, right. Then actually, your life become almost like a infinite dynamical with unlimited how to say power to drive yourself going. Sure,、right? absolutely. Well、that's, said. Yeah, that's really healthy because if I think about work, like I really need a reason to drive me through work. I, uni- I need that motivation. I need that power.、Mm-hmm. But when you start to unite these two things, it feels like it become a perpetuum. It's just like it keep going,、right. keep going. You want more. You do more, you become better, and then you want to do more. And guess what? That thing also make you money and earn you a living. Right. Isn't that great? And that's why we call it a lifestyle. That's、yeah. the idea: is thinking about this as not a leisure activity, but a leisure lifestyle. How do you build this in, into your life? And it will be different for everybody. Don't differentiate like、mm-hmm. work leisure. Right, right. right. If you can. Now, you know. To be fair, there are some. There are certainly a lot of、uh, vocations out there where that's really difficult to do. And、um, and I understand also、uh, for you know when you think about like the choices we make, my choice to be in recreation means that the dollars that I'm receiving are not the same level of somebody who say is going to be in medicine or in law or something like that. So I know that I give up certain things by making this choice. But for me, the outcomes it's it, it's based on what I value. Everybody values something a little different. Yep. Yeah, so at that's di- at, at different age too. Yes, that changes as we go, and that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
for me, uh, I, I focus a lot on artific artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And you can see when the economy comes in, people are going to be laid off. And people are already advocating ideas about universal basic income. That is, you don't have to work a yes. lot, but you get uh, enough to get it passed by. So leisure will become a more and a more important thing because even if you're not working, you're not wasted. Right. Right. If you're not making money, you're not wasted. You still are a, 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 a human being and mm -hmm. you want to do, uh, how to say, find your well being mm -hmm. through this kind of pr procedure. So leisure almost become a, a majority of what right. your life is going to be like. So it's also yeah. the space where the things happen, like like we were talking about before, where the bridges happen, where you build the connections. And so if you if you think about the idea of the universal basic income, leisure has to be part of that because if I'm asking people to um, to engage in whatever profession they're engaging in, I need to make sure that they have the space to think creatively, and the creativity and the problem solving and all those things that are developed that really help us move forward and advance as a society, those happen in leisure spaces. They happen at work or they happen at our profession, but they're also happening in the leisure space. It's when you have that quiet walk out in the woods and then all of a sudden, bam, that idea comes. Or you're a runner, you're running along and you're in flow and, and you're, you know, time is passing and then your brain is working out that problem and you don't even realize it. And all of a sudden you go, oh, I've got the answer. If you don't create that leisure space, it starts to feel like too much pressure and you can't get to that answer. It's the, it comes back to the stepping back piece again and being able to stop focusing for a second and just let your eyes soften and see what emerges. You know, those old, those pictures that where you used to sit and you had to wait for the objects to emerge in the picture, right? Interesting. You know, that kind of yeah. concept. Your brain is too busy running errands, then yes. they don't have time to make big decisions. Yep. Just as you, when you're running errands, one after another, right. you don't have time to think about your life. Interesting. Um, I have a friend who is super successful. I just had a conversation with her the other day. Um, she went through a divorce, and she's alone here. She doesn't have any relatives. She's originally from China. Mm -hmm. And now she just lost the passion to go anywhere. Like she doesn't want to travel at all. She doesn't want to buy things before she try to buy things, you mm -hmm. know, try to stimulate everything a little bit. Mm -hmm. She doesn't want to go to activities. She doesn't want to see people. Mm -hmm. And now it has came to a situation that she doesn't even want to go to work. So she sure. every morning it's really hard for her to convince herself, get up, go there and at least finish the work, get paid and then come right. back, lay down and do whatever. Um, what's your suggestion if you could? So my first suggestion is that this is something, it, it is not uncommon. Um, when you think about the major uh, things that happen in our lives, um, getting a divorce is right up there with death, uh, losing a family member. Yep, that's one of the biggest things that affects us. So my first suggestion is that professional counseling mm -hmm. is critical. Um, and I speak as one, for me, I've had counseling in my life at multiple times when I've had some of these uh, really major changes because that helps, I think, working with somebody who's a professional helps you identify what maybe some of the tools would be to help negotiate kind of how do I want to negotiate my life now. Um, it, she may negotiate it differently. She may make different choices. Uh, she might want to do some uh, things for herself. It's okay I think one of the things is understanding that it's okay to want to be alone. Um, it can be really difficult to uh, have expectations from others. You know, when we, when we go out and we spend time with other people and they know that we've gone through a traumatic situation, um, a lot of times people will want to say, oh, I'm so sorry, or, you know, what can I do to help? And really, in our heads, maybe we don't want anything from them we want them to treat us as we were before or maybe we do want help and 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 maybe people are afraid to say anything because they don't want to bring up the they don't past want to make it worse at right, least, right exactly yeah. so there's kind of this this challenge i think when somebody's in that scenario with kind of figuring out how to renegotiate yourself with people again um and so i would say honestly uh speaking to a professional yeah. would be the number one thing that i would That's recommend what i recommended her to do but yeah i just we're having a conversation about leisure. I always think in this kind of case, almost like finding a leisure activity to put yourself into. 
that yeah, would be super so nice. that's and that's hard because I would say sure there are a lot of different leisure activities that we use. We we look at leisure. Um, so I'm I'm in the recreation management and therapeutic recreation department. We have two programs in recreation management. We look at at recreation and leisure is kind of a day to day general well being component. So how do how do we create experiences for people that are healthy experiences that they're getting positive benefits from these leisure activities um, that they're they're building that piece of it in therapeutic recreation and I do not teach in that part I teach in recreation management in therapeutic recreation uh, my colleagues are looking at recreation as a therapeutic intervention mm -hmm. so that that would be a case where I would say maybe talk to a therapeutic recreation specialist or a recreation therapist that might be another thing um, we there's some areas around here, for example, that um, uh, I can't remember the name of it. There's a stable where they use horses to help people get through and deal with uh, traumatic events. So they work with individuals who have been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder or recovering veterans or things like that. So um, that might be another avenue to think about. But again, that's where you're looking at somebody who has the professional ability to diagnose or help you identify what the actual challenges are because the behaviors is what you're talking about whereas we want somebody to actually help you identify what is it that's going on and then once you identify that then you can say all right so here are some leisure activities that might be useful and here's how we might want to introduce them and that kind of thing but you want to you want to first have that systematic assessment of what is it that's really happening before I start to say oh here's a leisure activity that would be useful so is it rec is recreational uh, therapy mm -hmm. uh, connected to, to psychotherapy so mm -hmm. let's say if you go to a psychotherapist they can actually recommend you you should see a specialist in recreational therapy yeah so in totally separate so in recreation therapy we have we have recreation therapists who are at the hospitals so you will have a team, for example, um, if you're looking at a, a team to help you heal physiologically or emotionally, emotionally or cognitively, uh, you might have a team that would have a physical, an occupational therapist, a recreational therapist, and all of them would use a slightly different tool in the healing process. So they work as a team, so yep. you will be directed to the right person. Right. Oh, okay. Yep. That's, that's, that's very relieving. Okay. Um, I checked your website. Yes. I find, is it fair to you say you're a big National Park fan? I am a big National Park fan. So what's your, what's your, which one is your, <laughs> or which ones are your uh, favorite <laughs> National Park? Tell us about some stories about it. Sure. So I will tell you that uh, I really like National Parks that have a lot of interesting geographical features. That's the thing I love the most. Um, and my personal favorite in national parks is actually a very small, it's one of the least visited national parks in our system, and it's Isle Royale National Park, which is up in Lake Superior. So it's on a little island, it's an, actually an archipelago of islands, there's a whole bunch of them, they're about seven miles off the coast of um, Minneapolis, or Minnesota, so you know Minnesota reaches right around the northern part of Lake Superior, it's about seven miles off that coast, but it's part of Michigan, so you go to the upper peninsula of Michigan, and you take about a five-hour boat ride over there, and then you get dropped off. It is 99% federally designated wilderness. There are wolves and moose on the island. Um, so that's a really cool kind of a thing. There are, you know, you see all these, this, this kind of this neat group of wildlife. When you get there, there are a few hotels at one tiny spot of the island. And by hotel, I uh, use that term really loosely. <laughs> <laughs> they're kind of uh, like a glorified cabin is what they are. Um, they're pretty expensive. Most people are going there and they're doing backcountry camping. So they come with a backpack on their back and their lives in it. And you hike around that island. The reason that island is so special to me is because that's where I met my partner. Uh, he was a National Park Service ranger. And so we have that connection. I did my research up there also. Uh, in terms of how people get connected to place. Did and you know him before you go there? I did not. I met him up there. <laughs> it was great. I, I mean, you know, you, you're like, wow, you find the person who you want to spend the rest of your life with at the least visited national park in this remote island out in the middle of Lake Superior. Who does that? <laughs> but, yeah, that was, that's, that's why that place is so special to me. Um, I really, though, uh, have discovered I like um, – we have some places here in Wisconsin, St. Croix, 
uh, National River is part of the National Scenic Rivers uh, system. So it's not a national park, but it's a National Scenic River. Uh, and that that's just north of us by about, what, three and a half, four hours? Mm-hmm, roughly. Yep, and Apostle Islands. And I've been lucky enough to, a few years ago, when Lake Superior, most of, a big portion of Lake Superior froze, we were able to go up there and see the ice caves. If you are ever able to do that, I highly recommend it. It's possibly one of the coolest things I've ever done is walking on Lake Superior, first of all, and you can see down below the ice because it's so clear. And then you walk along. So it's really kind of this weird, bizarre feeling of being up in the air, but you're not. You're walking on water and you know it's frozen, but you still kind of freak out. And then... um, and then walking along and checking out all the cool ice caves and the ice formations and all that stuff. So that was, that's that's pretty neat. And that's that's near this area. So Does it happen every year? Or no, it has you, to be. You have to watch. Okay. Um, they post it on Facebook every every year. The Park Service will let you know it's looking like it might be happening, and it might only be available for a week or a few weeks or a few days. It just depends on conditions. You have to have a lot of really cold weather, very little wind. And then suddenly it's open. Yeah, so keep a track, keep track of that. Sounds awesome. Yeah. So we talk a lot, and look, leader, where leader led, led us, right? You <laughs> found your, your partners there. <laughs> yep, it's a good, good space That's for awesome. me. <laughs> um, so I would like to close with a question. Just I want to hear your opinion or concerns or expectations for the new millenniums in terms of, like, how things are different from the previous generations when mm-hmm. you grew up. And uh, what are your suggestions to them in from this, like how to balance work and life, how to find leisures in your life? Sure. So I think the first thing is figuring out what they do that um, they really enjoy. And, and going past just that kind of immediate enjoyment of social media or video gaming or any of that kind of thing, checking out something else that maybe they haven't tried before. So being willing to test a little bit. Um, I think, I, I don't, it's funny, I think people, off, we often talk about how the d- different the generations are, which certainly they are different in many ways, but we're also similar in many ways. And what we have find, found over time is that it's, it's almost more of an age thing. When we're younger, we're more adventurous. So when we're more adventurous, one of the things I suggest is take, a ta- take advantage of that adventurousness. If, if the time we're more ad- most adventurous is when we're kind of, you know, 16 to 24, that's the time to test something. Even if it does cost a little money, check it out and see if it's something that you really like. Be willing to take a little bit of a, of a risk. If you have never snowboarded, get some friends and go snowboarding. You know, especially here in La Crosse, we've got Mount La Crosse. Go check it out um, and test it. Don't be afraid of messing up because I think that's the biggest thing in that in that age group. I think that it's hard to imagine failing. And I will say this is different from when I was growing up. It was easier to fail and fall down and look stupid when I was growing up because there wasn't somebody standing there with their camera videotaping it, putting it on three different avenues of social media. And, and I get that's, that to me is kind of, there's a little bit of a terror in that of, man, I don't want to be the one that, you know, I, oh, look, I've got 10,000 looks and they're all laughing at me. You know, I don't want that. So I think that is a, a riskier piece for uh, young people today. Um, so maybe that's a really good reason to say, hey, friends, we're going to go out and do X, Y, Z, but guess what? We're all going to leave the phone in the basket when we go because I don't want a video of this showing up later. And then as soon as you set that away, as soon as you put that away, people can be a whole lot riskier. They can have a lot more fun, and that anxiety starts to leave because the anxiety oftentimes is connected to that possibility of others, um, you know, kind of keeping that as a forever memory, if you will. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, I also do you feel like um, the the new generation are more pressured, or actually they are more free, in terms of free time or you know the pressure from study and work. I think they're more pressured to perform mm-hmm. because I like I said I think if you make the mistake, 
everybody finds out about it far faster than ever anybody ever used to find out about it. Mm-hmm. I can nobody knows the mistakes that I made 20 years ago because there was nothing there to record them, right? The mistakes now seem to live they they live in infamy, um, and I think that's I think that's really challenging for young people. Do they have more actual time? I think the time is the same. Mm. Uh, my I know they say they don't have as much time. And I think when you're when you're in the younger age group where your parents are still making decisions for you and saying, yes, let's be on this team or let's be on that team or you've got to be in this after school program, I think those kids do have less time. I think they have less free time. I think their time is more structured. But once you get to the point where you're an adult, once you're yes, making your own the decisions. 19 to 25 group. Yep, that okay. 19 to 25 group. I think the time is probably the same. I think we're just doing different things in those times. Like where they have time, we both had to study. We just did it differently. So they have more access to more information. So a student now can look at, they can look globally at all this information. It's at their fingertips. They can, they can have to be researching information um, within a week that I would have been given months to do that because it would have been so hard to get that information, right? I was using different sources. Believe it or not, I was still using encyclopedias when I was a kid. Now, when I was in, when I was in college, we were starting to have the internet, right? But really, I was at the explosion of that. Um, so that, I think it's just, it's not that we have more time, it's that we're doing different things in those times. And it's beneficial to remind them, you do have the flexibility to, be, to, do, to do things in a different way. You do, right. yes. Mm. And it's worth it to you in the long run. I think that's the other piece is, and, and I think that's always been the case, is reminding youth that these things are valuable, valuable to you in the long run and they will, you will feel better about your life in general if you make some of these decisions to give yourself that, that uh, leisure break now. Awesome. Okay. I okay. think that's a lot. Great. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for asking me. This was really, this was such a pleasure. And I really appreciate your including, including me in this conversation. Cool. Thank you. Yeah.